Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, today we were going to review uh, Bhagavad Gita from chapter one to chapter six. That's the first one third of the entire book. And I believe it's cover uh, Kama Yoga. And uh, then next week, we are going to back to the Taoism study uh, about the, the chapter three for the cultivation of life. And I do find some interesting part related to cultivation of life and the Bhagavad Gita chapter six. I will ask uh, Sashi today. And then uh, June 10th, two weeks from now, uh, Sashi is going to continue our journey to of Bhagavad Gita. And she's, he's going to continue for chapter seven and the chapter eight. And then we're going to move forward. So uh, today is Sashi, uh, uh, Sashi's session, and uh, then it's kind of free uh, discussion. Share how do you, what do you learn on this one, and uh, there is any question uh, about the uh, Bhagavad Gita from chapter one to six, and uh, then so uh, if you miss uh, some of the chapter, and that's a good chance to catch up, and so you can continue. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sashi, please. Yeah, so I so we did chapters one through six. Um, I mean, I can I can give you a brief summary to brush up your memory on what this is about. Is uh, um, uh, it's a it's a war. It's a uh, two uh, cousins. You know, they uh, they're fighting for the kingdom. Um, so the whole epic is called as Mahabharata. Um, and it's a it's a very wide uh, ranging <laughs> topic, and uh, um, at some point uh, the uh, the so called good party and then the bad party has taken over the kingdom, and now the the good party, which is the Arjuna, is the sort of one of the uh, main uh, people. I mean, he's not the king, but his his older brother would be the king, but I, maybe he would be the king, I guess. Um, so um, he is fighting because. Uh, the, a lot, lot has happened where, you know, the so-called bad guys who have taken over the kingdom, uh, the bad brothers. Um, I mean, I, I, again, it is bad from the perspective of as you're reading the story, but there, there were, there are times, there's so gray shades of uh, these characters on how uh, the Kauravas or the Trashtra is the, is the brother, uh, you know, the, the other guy, uh, he is blind. Um, and he, he's sort of mistreated because he's blind effectively, but, you know, it's not quite mistreated because the idea for a king to be physically, you know, properly available so that he can rule the kingdom properly. So they make his brother, the king, a uh, younger brother, but then it goes, you know, he takes it back, the blind king. Um, and then his son, who is not blind. Uh, Duryodhana happens to be the main villain of this whole narrative. Um, and then he has a hundred other brothers and, you know, uh, there, there is uh, uh, kings uh, who have allied with the, the bad force, if you will. Um, and there, there's a variety of things happen where, you know, uh, the, the uh, love interest or the wife of Arjuna uh, in India back then, there used to be this uh, thing called a Swayamvara, where the the princess gets to pick her um, her own uh, husband among like 50 different uh, people or uh, kings and from different kingdoms would show up and then she gets a chance to you know pick somebody uh from from them and uh turns out that Duryodhana was also there um and uh she kind of mocks him um uh, she's kind of a playful young girl, uh, Draupadi. Um, so she mocks him saying, oh, you know, because uh, he kind of tumbles on some uh, uh, some footstep or something. And then she just says, oh, you know, uh, 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 look at this blind kid who, whose father is blind or something like that, right? Some, something to the effect that, you know, he's blind um, uh, just like his father. And uh, that kind of irates uh, Duryodhana a lot. Um, so then um, further along, uh, they trick, Duryodhana tricks the Arjuna and his brothers to um, uh, join a play of, uh, 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 it's called a dute, but uh, it's basically a, 
what is the equivalent here? I guess um, Ludo or some some something where you know they can they put uh, their kingdoms at stake, and you know back then uh, wife was considered as a property. <laughs> Uh, so they put uh, Draupadi uh, as uh, a stake, you know, just because uh, the other party says, hey, you know, you've lost your kingdom, you've lost all these things, you know, you need to put uh, now your wife uh, at stake, you know, and then win everything back. And then they kind of uh, abuse that uh, game in a way to trick uh, the good people and uh, they lose again. Uh, so Duryodhana at that point, he is trying to take the revenge of what Draupadi did to him. And he asks his younger brother to go find uh, the person, find the queen or uh, the, uh, the person. And uh, she refuses to come in the court uh, because uh, she doesn't want to break the decorum um, and stuff like that. But, you know, he drags her with her hair all the way to the court. It is super insulting. Nobody really pays any attention. The brothers, the the the. So she she's in a marriage where uh, she has five husbands at the same time. All the five brothers on the Pandava side, they get married to the same woman. So we, we don't know how that works, but that's one of the key things of that story. Um, so all these five brothers are helpless when Draupadi is brought to the court. And uh, the insult doesn't stop there. Uh, Duryodhana basically says that, hey, you know, um, why don't, you know, we need to just um, get her naked and stuff like that, right? So it, it goes on, like the insult goes on and they start uh, pulling her, her sari and uh, Krishna comes to her help basically at that point, you know, so-called, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a beautiful book written by Divakur uh, Kulkarni, um, she has written the whole story of Mahabharata from the perspective of the this uh, um, actor, the the the, the main uh, female actor, Draupadi, and uh, she has a beautiful take on um, the so-called, you know, like typically in a very um, um, regular, superficial way, you know, you say, oh, you know, Sh Sri Krishna is the god. And God was supplying extra cloth material, and then she never really showed off her body. Uh, but there's di there's different understandings as to what what might have happened during that time. Um, but regardless of that, you know that kind of leads to this war, effectively. Um, and now it, it, there's so many things, atrocities that have happened um, uh, that they say, okay, you know, what is the only solution? Um, and uh, uh, that's where they are now. Um, and uh, they, they have made a decision. Arjuna has made a decision. This, the, you know, we are going to fight. And uh, this is literally the last second where, you know, the Kauravas, the bad side has come to the battlefield. The Pandavas, the good people, they have come to the battlefield. Now they're facing each other. And there is an existential crisis that uh, Arjuna goes through. Uh, so Arjuna basically is, uh, um, he asks uh, Krishna uh, to, well, th that's another interesting story, uh, which uh, might be might be of interest for you guys is like, uh, so Krishna is not part of Kaurava or Pandava, right? He's somebody else. He's another friend. He's also a king in his own uh, kingdom. Uh, they are called as Yadavas, you know, totally different. Um, so, but Arjuna is friends with uh, uh, with uh, her, uh, with him. And it so happens that Arjuna's mom is a sister of uh, Krishna's father. So they are somewhat related. Yeah. Um, so he he comes, uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, Krishna is very much part of the whole family uh, in a way, uh, you know, he, he loves Pandavas and stuff like that. And he also talks to Kauravas, but uh, uh, though the other people, they always are mocking him um, and uh, stuff like that. So they, they, they don't have uh, the perfect uh, dynamics. Um, so now that they have decided that they're going to have this big war between Kauravas and Pandavas for the kingdom, um, they are now getting all the different uh, other kingdoms to come and help, you know, on which side are you going to fight, right? So they simultaneously 
actually Duryodhana reaches to Yadavas uh, and you know he he's looking for Krishna and uh, he finds him uh, napping in his room right you know his uh, head is on the sofa and then he's uh, kind of uh, laid down and there's a chair there and Arjuna also arrives at the same time so Duryodhana runs inside and he sits on the chair uh, which is close to Krishna's head uh, near the where he's sleeping on the bed and Arjuna doesn't have a seat to sit so he goes and sits near uh, Krishna's feet um, on the bed directly so now uh, and they're waiting for Krishna to wake up and uh, uh, Krishna wakes up um, so and they both are there to ask for help now it is interesting how help can be completely diametrically opposite depending on where you're coming from right what what is the help I mean here we are they are in a war situation and they need probably armaments they need armies and they need people to help them out right for both of them um so they sit on uh, uh, like that you know uh, and Krishna because he opens his eyes you know he sees Arjuna uh, first and then Duryodhana says hey look I'm here too um and uh, you know, I since I was a little bit ahead of Arjuna, I need to get the priority uh, to choose what I need from you for this war. Um, but Krishna says, "Well, you know, it just so happens that I've seen Arjuna first, so I'm going to give Arjuna the first chance to ask." And then um, Duryodhana suddenly is quite depressed, and he says, "Oh, damn! You know, now the whole army is going to go to Arjuna." And Arjuna says. Uh, well, you know, I, for my uh, side, um, no, Krishna basically said, you have to pick between me and the whole army, the Yadavas, you know, they had like 100,000 um, people or something like that. And uh, he says, that's the, that's the choice, you know, you, you are two people and I, I put me versus this army, go ahead and pick. So Arjuna says, okay, well, if that's the choice, then I'm going to pick you, Krishna. I want you on my side, just one person. And Duryodhana is very, you know, he just kind of smiles internally, laughs, and he says, oh, finally, you know, I think I was so worried that he was going to get the whole army. So, and he asks for the, he chooses the whole Yadava army and uh, he gets those 100,000 um, soldiers. Um, and then Krishna basically uh, joins Arjuna and Pandava side and Arjuna... Uh, he, uh, but Krishna has promised, um, uh, who does he promise? I think he promises the mother of Duryodhana because she's also close to Krishna. You know, he, he promises her that, look, this war is going to happen. I can't help it, but I promise that I'm not going to pick up any arms. So I'm not going to be fighting. I'm not going to be the soldier. I, I promise you that much is what he says. So he keeps that promise. He tells Arjuna, look, I'm not going to fight. Uh, so uh, how do you want me to help you? And then, you know, he ends up becoming the charioteer for uh, his chariot, uh, Arjuna's chariot. And uh, so it's a it's a great, uh, like there's so much uh, metaphor here, uh, you know, a blind king, the ki the hundred kids that he has, you know, they are blind in a way because even though they have eyes, uh, they all are blind to understand what is the reality. Uh, you know, they they choose um, just, uh, uh, I mean, there's just so much greed uh, in their mindset, uh, the way they are approaching it. Uh, they, they want the kingdom to themselves and they are not sharing anything with the brothers. And here you have on the other side, you know, they have chosen Krishna, uh, who is completely not going to fight. Uh, and then they, he gives him the control of his uh, chariot, the reins, right? It's almost kind of like, you know, I have uh, I have God on my side, you know, Arjuna, it's effectively like that, right? I mean, um, the, the notion of God here, uh, Krishna is God, uh, sort of um, doesn't really appear immediately. The reader sort of knows, but the players in that story don't really know, uh, right? Uh, for the longest time. Uh, they have seen some random things along the way. Um, but again, from our point of view, from contemporaneous point of view, or, you know, how, at least how I think about it, um, 
it's just uh, somebody who is well balanced person uh, who is uh, driving the chariot uh, basically and uh, and arjuna is a good warrior but he is not a good decision maker as we will see right in this gita so um he basically asks krishna hey look you know can you uh, drive me to the center of the battlefield because i need to see um uh who is uh, who am i fighting you know well, what's going on on the other side um so that's where the first chapter starts right so he uh, krishna takes him uh, out there and uh, he um uh, arjuna basically looks at his grandpa is there his teacher is there and everybody's there his brothers and then he's also worried about um all the different kingdoms that have joined to fight and uh, some of his, them are his friends and he's worried suddenly about uh, the whole population and uh, you know uh, the natural worry from him his point of view is look is this even worth it man like i mean do we really need this kingdom this bad we are we really going to butcher thousands and hundreds of thousands of people like this uh that does absolutely does not make sense and he being a good soul uh he says to krishna look i i have no energy to fight these people i might as well i would rather lose um so here here i'm i'm going to take a pause here so what what do you guys you know raise a hand what do you guys think i mean is this a good uh, stance that he takes i mean obviously we have done six chapters so there's no secret but i would like you to uh sort of like think honestly how you would react to such a situation uh, you may uh, uh, today also we we come across these kind of uh, realities where you know we sometimes have to make a hard choice you know be it with our kids or you know in the office or you know what not um and uh, you know we we tend to take this so called uh, social condition based good path um uh, for many reasons one is you know we are we are afraid of the cops we are afraid of the law or uh, we are afraid of what the neighbors are going to say or what not right i mean that happens to us in real life uh, so the floor is open yeah go ahead jason okay so um i i i i think the piano side i that's my uh, i i at beginning i think the chapter 1 is not important okay because the key lesson is uh, uh the rest of them the during the dialogue so but uh we we hear you talk about this again and again and again every time you mention this one so i it's it's right it's uh, uh it, it's a set up the background right it set up the background and it's every condition to or not to do or to be or not to be that's, that's always the situation we have we can bring up any kind of metaphor we want but yes. basics uh, uh actually our daily decision right to do or not to do or action or inaction that's every uh every decision we are making you know from uh for, from the small thing like whether or not i go out for dinner or mm -hmm. you know i'm going to quit my job you know that's you know the the, the, the same situation it happened every day situation. and you know we we tend to uh, kind of take a path where we sort of uh sometimes we are not i mean like i said right i think i think if if we had a much more difficult i mean just imagine right you and your brother here you're standing in front of each other and you're about to the 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 call to action at that point is you have to kill your brother to save the planet <laughs> that's literally what arjuna is facing and you know like if i put myself in that shoe i i don't care how terrible my brother is um you know uh, would i take that decision um and that that is where uh, it's it's really hard sometimes uh, for us to kind of distinguish between what is the right thing to do versus what uh uh you know what other people will think about me if i did something you know if i killed my own brother uh, sort of thing right 
Um, so Joseph, you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I thought a lot about this. Um, I think, um, you know, you, the reason it begins in the middle of the war, uh, and then you think about uh, the um, the meaning behind that, and I and I think about it in the terms of, and I actually brought this up uh, the other evening. Uh, it it it's not totally dissimilar to something where. Uh, it, you know, and I know the two are very different, but um, uh, in Christianity, where they talk about the idea of accepting your cross, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? And so that you're taking up, uh, you're accepting your duty. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes in the world that we don't necessarily want to do uh, certain things. Mm -hmm. However, there is the right thing to do, mm -hmm. no matter how, you know, uh difficult it may be um these this is the extreme circumstance right so if you're mm -hmm. demonstrating that a principle works mm -hmm. you have to put it in a circumstance where it absolutely the individual understands that this is true this is what you know this is the way um uh the world has to go uh mm -hmm. in this particular instance it doesn't have to you have choice mm -hmm. but nonetheless um that you uh you have a decision to make and it doesn't necessarily work out the world doesn't work out exactly the way you want it to mm -hmm. um and that's the most important thing to realize you may lose family members you may have to go against your own family mm -hmm uh in doing the right thing in a particular circumstance mm -hmm. uh and that can't detract you from doing the right thing mm -hmm. um so as far as setting up the dialogue itself the dialogue between krishna and arjun mm -hmm. um i see this as you know uh, it's a it's a it's a a very uh effective way to communicate the decisions that we have to make sometimes and how difficult they may be. Um, and, uh, but there is a right and wrong thing to do. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's, uh, um, I think it, it, it's, it also set, you know, it sets up with the idea of how all the philosophy and all the wisdom that subsequent wisdom that we get from the you know the yogs uh you know from you know the even the, the idea of self the ego everything else that meditation um the different journeys mm -hmm. that we can take the multiple different journeys that's the one distinction i would make between christianity is that there's multiple paths yes uh to the center Mm -hmm. um whereas you know as as there's only seems to be one path um mm -hmm. so uh if you were to draw a diagram it would be circular versus where it would be a little bit more direct uh if it were christianity mm -hmm. um so uh that's the beauty of it and that then um from there you can start to uh uh, uh accept the world for what it is and not what you want it to be and then go from there so yeah. I think as far as the chapter one, it's really, it's a very good way of demonstrating that if you believe this to be true, it's a principle. Here's a circumstance that you would, you know, not want to be in. Mm -hmm. And here it is. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, that's a great uh, observation. I, and I think we, we are always uh, faced with choices in our lives, right? Um, but uh, what is important with the first chapter is uh, it's called as Vishada Yoga, means, uh, you know, Arjuna's uh, depression uh, that he's going through. And uh, that is considered as a yoga, you know, uh, <laughs> um, which which itself is uh, kind of uh, uh, is oxymoron, the wo word there, uh, where, you know, uh, they, they, they just don't go together. Right. So the depression yoga, effectively, uh, dejection yoga and. Uh, that is something that uh, you can't call dejection as yoga, um, but uh, but it is a 
it's almost like, you know, we are faced as human beings with so many choices in our lives. Uh, and then we, we kind of select whatever we want to select, but they tend to be very like, not very earth shattering decisions, if you will. Once in a while, we do face things like that. Um, but the true existential crisis moment is really the moment that we all fear, actually, right? We don't want to be there. We just want to be on the surface level and, you know, kind of float along in life. But those, in, those amazing amount of depression times where you really have to make that choice and, you know, somebody loved one passed away or, um, you know, your job situation or whatnot, right? Something that kind of really shakes your reality. Uh, that is an opening to, um, so, you know, here he has completely given up, but the reality is that there's hundreds and thousands of people ready to kill each other in the battlefield. And this important person has, is about to give up, which means it is going to impact a lot of these poor people who are trying to follow Arjuna uh, in this war. They are going to be badly, worsely impacted. Uh, you know, bad might be if they lose, but if Arjuna gives up, it's going to be worse for them. Um, and uh, it probably is not going to do any good to anybody, even though Arjuna's uh, stance kind of seems good. Um, so uh, it is beautiful that his friend Krishna uses that like, oh, why he should fight the war. And then he really takes that into this journey of uh, self or how to live life. And what is the form of duty? What should we call as duty? Why do we have to do what we have to do? What, what is our inner calling? And, uh, you know, how do we know what is the right thing, you know, in a given situation? And it's easy to say we have to do the right thing, but then what does that even mean? Um, so that whole discussion where he goes from uh, why he should consider himself as a warrior and fight, and then suddenly Arjuna takes that into this whole direction of um, overall, what is life, you know? And I, I know I've had situations, I've gone through divorce, I've gone through a variety of things, you know, coming to America from India and stuff like that. Um, there have been times where it's like, everything just kind of feels like I've, I've lost everything. You know, it's like, what is going to happen now, right? And those are actually the moments where uh, you gravitate towards trying to really question who am I, you know, what is this? What is this? Why is this thing happening? Why does th this have to be like this? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of anger and a lot of uh, emotions and stuff like that. But after you get tired through that rigmarole of emotions, you get to a certain level of peace uh, with the situation. And that peace is now you're wanting to question is my brother really my brother? You know, is my, what is this relationship I have with my father? You know, why, why does this have to be like this? You know, so all the norms the society has put, those norms work in good times. <laughs> but when reality comes, uh, reality hits you hard. And that hard hitting, you know, we tend to kind of run away from it, right? And what Krishna and the first chapter tries to impress upon us is that, it is really, really, we should thank, uh, you know, uh, the universe, I guess, that that opportunity has come to you. It's very rare that people get this opportunity to kind of make this step jump from a mundane life. And now you're like, boom, you know, that's, that's really the reality, you know, brother, father, friend, you know, this enemy who I hated so much. I don't even know why I hated that person, you know? <laughs> so th those are the things that kind of will change your perspective. And here he, Krishna totally changes the whole game saying, you know, things like, you know, in the second chapter, right? Second chapter is effectively the whole summary of the whole book, you know? It's, it's interesting. It starts with the depression yoga and there's a solution given to you in second chapter immediately. And that is, that's it. You could just stop there. You know, second chapter, you could just stop there. That's it. But then 
it, it, there's the, all the details that that follow along there. Uh, but uh, but yeah, no, sorry, Joseph, you were going to say something. Yeah, go ahead. No, I mean you you need to move on. I mean, but I, I no no I don't need to move also, on. Yeah, what, we can, it's an open. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I, I think that the 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 really this kind of also sets up um, as to how important it is for the four yogs, why knowledge is important, why why uh, service is important, you know, um, why meditation uh, mm -hmm. is important. Uh, um uh why uh devotion mm -hmm. is important devotion to what is the right thing to do right. all you know all of those start mm -hmm. to are come into context because mm -hmm. you're in this position as to that it, it, it seems to be untenable right mm -hmm. um and it is to us this you know that's part of the point um so so you start to see why all the practices uh, knowledge of what the right thing to do is, how the universal principle mm -hmm. actually fits into this, uh, into into this um, uh, uh, sto uh, you know story, uh, yeah. and then you, 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 the the the, the uh, I I do agree with you that we you know the second the second chapter to me has always been the most important mm -hmm. um, uh, as far as you know ego is concerned understanding the self and then kind of understanding the root causes of what is really drawing you away from your center yeah uh, what is the root of your desire mm -hmm. right and um as opposed to uh just you know acting in a certain way without necessarily contemplating and the reason that's so important is because you look inward to act out Mm. and once you look inward to act out mm. that allows you to see the god in everyone god in everyone and that's yes. mm -hmm. and that's because you have to look inside mm -hmm. and that's where you start to see mm -hmm. uh you know you see yourself and then mm -hmm. you see yourself interconnected with the with everything else yeah because mm -hmm. you look at your own darkness mm -hmm. and so um it's it's a very uh, important lesson um, mm -hmm. because uh, you're confronting yourself and and I equated it to stoicism the other night is a little bit as well because it's the idea um, that you're looking at what's in your control and that directly relates to the idea of service mm -hmm. um, in the sense that I look what's inside and then um i start to to understand that you know everything else is 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 obviously outside my control but i have an opportunity to do the right thing mm -hmm. and um what that right thing is then we have a set of kind of um uh you know not we have a uh, various ways you know the gunas and all the other aspects of really knowing the depth of uh, hinduism uh, as to how to to um to know what the right thing is to do but it also chapter two really focuses on uh detachment mm -hmm. which is also very important um, when you're talking about detaching from externals in order to understand what the right thing is to do because if you're acting for externals, you're acting away from what who you really are. Uh, so, and then that's that's also a, a really important one. Um, I think uh, because um, uh, the you start to disregard truth um, the minute you start acting towards what's external as opposed to what's internal. Mm -hmm. uh and so uh this disregard uh meaning what is truth in this particular instance it's a bias. what you believe to be yeah what is wisdom yeah so yeah i mean uh um uh anyway i'll leave it there actually i've been talking about no 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 so they, they, that's that's really a good point that you bring up and you know one, one thing that i just want to bring back to this discussion is you know look at how animals behave right animals behave 
in a certain way, you know, when they're hungry, the lineage is going to attack the deer and kill it. And there's no question. There's no nothing else. So there is no buildup of this so-called karma in that kingdom, right? The animal kingdom, right? There's no there's no such thing as karma is going to get you. That's not happening there. It's uh, they, it's totally driven by need. And, uh, you know, that's almost kind of like, you know, one of the terms that uh, we use in Sanskrit is Kriya. Uh, Kriya is a response to your need. You know, I need this, so I do it, right? Uh, karma is where, as a human being, we tend to, <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately, uh, yeah, go ahead. How do you spell that? Kriya, K-R-I-A-Y-A, Kriya is, Kriya is all, it's just an act out of need, right? It's uh, like, hey, no, I, I have a, uh, my, my cheek is uh, itching, so I just go and scratch it, right? So that's, that's just basically just that. And I, okay, uh, thank you, thank you. And then karma, what ha uh, what happens is, you know, now suddenly, I, I was just about to say, like human beings, um, we are basically animals, but with this extra factor of uh, uh, mind, right? Um, so we we mind is what um, brings within us this notion of um, defining I and defining you, right? The others that distinction and really typically what happens is um, our actions are always driven by, you know, one of the things Arjuna says is that, um, look, you know, even if I win this kingdom, if all my loved ones are dead, what's the point of it, right? So that that itself is a very selfish uh uh observation and which is what krishna alludes to is like and uh i mean not directly but sort of indirectly uh, and and we can look at it within ourselves right you know typically we want to buy this new house or any other things you know um uh, most of the time it is either if you're by yourself and you're living in this big house i don't think you would enjoy as much you know you, if anything you might actually uh, feel miserable and lonely <laughs> in that big house but what you need is you need a probably a wife and kids and friends and and some enemies you know because you want to show them show it off um so uh, that that this is what arjuna immediately says in first chapter itself saying hey look what is the point in me winning you know when all these people are going to die uh you know the so that that kind of shows that he wants to win for the sake of the others not for the call of action, what is required at the moment. And this is what Krishna kind of uh, wants to suggest that the moment you are bringing these other parties in your decision-making, it's going to bias your decision. You are not going to be taking the right decision. That, then forget about these loved ones, forget about the enemies. It's not the first time you fought Arjuna. You know, you fought so many wars and you have butchered hundreds of thousands of people, you know, without any kind of a dilemma in your mind and uh, what's happening right now. Um, and it's just because there are loved ones on the other side. It's just a war. And, and he also tells him, look, even if you go away, they are, all these people are going to die. They are, they not, nobody is going to live infinitely, even your loved ones, just because you love them. That doesn't mean that they're going to get a longer life and you yourself are going to die. And they're going to be probably fighting this war regardless of you because they are here to fight a war and they're going to fight a war and they're going to kill each other, you know, and I already know what is going to happen and they, they're going to die, you know, so there's no point in crying. Uh, and, uh, you know, you are, even though you're talking like uh, you think you're talking wisdom, but that wisdom is not your pure wisdom, right? It is something that society has made you think like that. Society has made you think in terms of what is good and you shouldn't hurt somebody, you shouldn't you know, pick up arms, you know, don't hurt your brother, you know, all these social conditioning, you're just repeating like a parrot. You know, you're not really, this is not your own wisdom. Um, so, so that is the human condition that we have been, um, uh, you know, given uh, on this planet, right? Versus an animal who is going to kill and they're not going to feel any remorse. 
uh, or they're going to do whatever they need to do, right? And they, they don't collect karma. We collect karma. We collect karma not because there is some other body that is sitting out there and keeping an account of your good and bad actions. No, <laughs> it's, a, it's what it does to us when we take that action. So if I take that action, knowing that I'm hurting somebody, I am creating that karma within me saying that, oh, wait a second, you know, I did hurt that person and I'm going to carry that and it is going to come back to bite me. Uh, so to not have the karma created, the advice Krishna gives in second chapter or third chapter now is that you need to drop this I-ness, this doership, you know, the doership is the biggest problem. You know, you need to do your action with a, and the doership comes from what? The doership comes from you thinking, this is I, mine, my wife, my kids, my kingdom, my friend, my teacher, my uncle, my granddad, all that stuff, right? So that this whole mine builds your my, I, and your actions are thus skewed and you're building a bad karma and uh, you are not going to take the right decision and uh, you're going to be in the cycle of birth and death. The cycle of birth and death is also kind of interesting, right? Cycle of birth and death is at least the way I understand it. And I think I've mentioned that in our talks in the past, even though there is a, there is a notion of uh, you know, reincarnation, you know, people coming back to rebirth, all that is great. You know, they, they, there's a purpose to that. You know, it's, it's as if a device for you to think about life in a positive way so you can live life uh, productively and uh, much more effective, uh, you know, when you're coming to like being a human being on this planet. But to me in general, it is we're daily or every moment we are reborn in a way, you know, our cells are dying, we are coming back. Or even if you look at a span of lifespan, uh, you know, just a short span, like, you know, maybe my lifespan with the last company that I was, and then this company that I am working with, or with my wife and without my wife or my childhood, right? At each of these points, I'm doing some things based on my understanding or my fears or my attraction or my attachment to people. And that is building karmas. Those karmas in my next life, I'm going to somehow pay for it, right? You know, in my, whatever I did in childhood or whatnot, I come to America, somehow that thing has followed me, the thing that I ran away from or thing that I totally was in love and enamored by it. Um, I realized after some time, you know, it is only short-lived um, anyways, and I wasted so much time in that. And uh, so this notion of karma follows us because we uh, have this attachment to things or fear of things. And detachment is absolutely a key principle. And that leads us into the third chapter where he uh, extols upon um, karma yoga, right? Karma yoga, you know, what is the right thing to do? How do you know that? The right thing to do is known when you, the action comes to you a little more naturally without you judging the outcome. Now he says you don't want to pay attention to results. Obviously that's the part of the judging process, right? Uh, so if you don't care about win or loss and the action is presented to you, the win or loss is really a determination by you and the society. So you're really doing it for the others, not so much for you. Um, and uh, so this other factor needs to be removed, right? You know, you, you don't want to worry about what people are going to say and all that stuff. So then how do you really conduct this action? So he gives a very nice, simple principle, you know, just devote the action to me. <laughs> that devote the action to me, Krishna, is not a selfish thing, you know. It's a, that me is the deeper me, you know, the consciousness uh, that we all have. So we, the layers that we have, there's the deepest layer is the consciousness. The next layer, if you will, is the intellect. The next layer after that is the mind, then follows the senses. 
and then our body and you know, our parts and stuff like that. And then, uh, then there are the objects out there. So as the stimulation comes through our eyes or ears uh, within us, mind immediately wants to look at the form and say, oh, that's a rectangle laptop. I give it a name. I have a, I have an immediate like liking or disliking. I want to go to it and not go to it, right? So mind is that that biggest problem child, right? And then what the mind tends to do is it says, oh, you know, intellect, it kind of overtakes intellect and it says, oh, you know, remember that last time we did this. So we're going to do this now again. And then intellect says, okay, fine, just do it, right? So now the whole body is following uh, and the, the horses are hither or skither, right? Everywhere. Uh, so so the, uh, the me that Krishna is talking about, devote the action to me, karma yoga, you know, we started from the dejection yoga to action yoga, which is the karma yoga. What it comes to is every action that you do, don't do it for anybody. Don't do it for yourself, meaning don't worry about the result. You're doing it for a larger purpose. Now that larger purpose, if you want to call it Brahman, fine. But if it makes it easy, think about a deity, dedicate the action. Because when you are going to dedicate your action to some higher cause, you are going to make a right choice. Not biased by your family, not biased by any of the mundane uh, earthly uh, things. So that's, uh, that's quite a deep understanding. People have taken that to mean that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a devotee of Krishna. Krishna doesn't say that anywhere. That me that he's talking about is the me that we all have. You have a me, I have a me. That whole me is the oneness, the consciousness. And if we dedicate our action to that consciousness, what we are doing is we are kind of shutting down our mind and shutting down our intellect. And now whatever comes out is a pure action. So that's uh, that's the thing. Uh, so Joseph, you want to add something? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, Oceans can speak really quickly because he hasn't okay. spoken yet, but then I, I can go after that. Okay, Ocean, go ahead. Hey, thank you very much. It's a good, I've been, I've been reading the Bhagavad Gita um, several times in the last uh, 10, 20 years. So it's re good to revisit. And nice. I have some questions from time to time, you know, and I good to hear what you said in the last three minutes. But uh, I have a simple question. So it, it, I, let's say example, okay? So life example instead of abstract discussion. So let's say I felt a Brahman or I felt a bigger whole picture. I saw some look like frail looking homeless people or whatever or whatever you know and uh um so you know not considering i you know considering about my family or my own interests and uh, just be so you you feel the love for the humanity and just give the money or just do anything to help this guy you know and uh you know and uh, this guy turned out to be secret child molester because when you're helping this this guy instead of letting him die, he's gonna secretly continue to molest the child or other like a female homeless people, raping homeless people, so forth. Well, that you know, and but my point is though, when you feel, you know, certain force, um, spiritual force, yeah, this is the this is it. This is I'm doing it for. I feel the will of God, will of God, or feel the sense of Brahman, and I'm doing it. But there is no enlightened masters besides you to tell to verify yeah what you're doing is correct but what you you're not doing is correct so who's going to who's going to who's going to tell you that what you're doing is go coincide with the you know the brahman or not you may regardless of how you feel you may end up hurting the society so how are you going to answer to that thank you very much yeah, yeah yeah stay stay with me yeah i think that's a great question right so that's that's a dilemma uh, you what you're presenting is you are the arjuna and you are now uh, wondering, I'm, I'm no Krishna, but I'm going to give you my take on this, is uh, that, first of all, don't help anybody. Um, help is a very egoistic uh, word. I am helping the homeless man. Um, so when you have that notion of I am helping, you think that you have an upper hand over the homeless man, right? Um, so, and then you feel like, oh, I better be you know, this person be be thanking me. But really, you can turn that around, right? 
the turning around piece, in fact, he covers this, Krishna covers this in later chapters where he talks about Kshatriyas, you know, the warrior clan people, which is Arjuna, and uh, they are known to give uh, alms to the community. Now, Dan, we call it your, um, uh, you know, uh, help to people, right? Uh, so they, they are very generous people. So that generosity can be done for two purposes. One is they are trying to gain name in the society or they're trying to do something, you know, like, uh, you know, some ulterior motive, right? Um, so uh, in when you are helping somebody, the really, I mean, the Krishna's whole thing can be summarized into the reality is me. I am the reality. I am the most important thing. The other person is the other person. Other person is not my responsibility. So when I help, what is it doing to me? Do I feel happy about that help? Is it bringing me happiness? Or am I worried about what my help is going to do to this other person? So now you're controlling that person to whatever extent you want to control him, right? And now the impact of that is not so much the other person. The impact is on your mind. So that 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 uh, waves, that kind of turbulence that any action can cause in your mind, that's a problem, right? So anything you do in life, any damn thing, kill a person, steal, <laughs> do a good act, anything, make sure that it doesn't leave those ripples on your mind. Okay, so here you help a uh, homeless person and that left a ripple on your mind saying, wait a second, that, that could be a child molester. Yes, you're absolutely right. So, you know, um, then they, there is no goodwill or there is no collection of good karma from the fact that you help somebody. Let's just make that clear. That is a complete, uh, that's my understanding of religion, okay? I, they, now you do that out of your kindness and now that guy might be a, a child molester, that guy might be whatever they, they might be. Go approach that problem separately from the fact that you're helping. Two different actions. One is you're helping. That help that you give is bringing some happiness to you. See, every time an action that we do, sat chit anand, right? Existence, awareness, bliss. So uh, it looks like you're driving. I hope you're safe. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. So uh, the action that you're doing, right? If yeah. you can express happiness in it, that expression of happiness is very multiplicative. You know, you can bring about heaven in hell. Just the mere presence of you your happiness, expressing happiness. And that comes from your fountain of bliss. So when, so the action that you're helping this person, look within, did it make you happy? Great. That is one action done. Don't, don't leave any impact on your mind. Don't let any karma collect. The, then as further down along, you figure out, oh, that guy was a child molester. Forget about the fact that you helped him. That's not the connection. The fact that he's a child molester, address it separately, right? Go talk to the laws uh, people, talk to this person, you know? So the, the, there's this uh, beautiful uh, story about, you know, how uh, bliss and heaven and hell, you know, one of the Swamis was uh, uh, talking about. And I think uh, it's, uh, was, there a, was there a poet or a author by, his last name was Buck uh, in, I don't know, it was in America or somewhere, um, but, um, he he was one Pearl of those, Buck? huh? Pearl Buck, what are you talking about? Maybe, maybe. But anyways, yeah, this is like centuries ago. Apparently, this uh, story happens where he uh, he basically is an atheist, right? He doesn't he doesn't believe in God. Uh, but the funny thing is, he likes to go to the church. He wants to sit there, and you know. Uh, so one of his friends asks him, "Why why do you go to church? I mean, you don't believe in God." He says, I love to see the happiness in that, that priest, he, the, the guy who gives the sermon, and the joy that brings to that person. That joy is so tangible. Like, I, I, I love, I, it's, it does something to me. 
I don't believe in this stuff, but I look in his eyes something that I feel I'm missing because of my lack of belief and not that I want to believe, but I'm there. So he ends up talking to one of the uh, um, the the priests saying, hey, look, um, you in just in your sermon right now, you said, look, you know, uh, yeah, good people, good action. You know, you're going to go to heaven. Uh, bad people, bad actions. You're going to go to hell uh, and stuff like that. So and uh, he basically says, you know, uh, what if there is a, a bad person who does good action? And, you know, what happens? Does he go to heaven? And so he comes up with this, all these permutation combinations and things like that. And uh, the priest basically is uh, kind of flustered. Uh, and, you know, they, because, you know, a lot, lot of the, you know, when we talk about these, all these uh, uh, meta ideas, uh, they we don't there's no science around it this is a guideline for us to uh ponder upon and come up with our own theories that you know uh, that that is obviously you know one important lesson that buddha gives is don't follow anybody right here's buddhism but don't follow anybody you have to come up with your own reality that is going to guide you in your life right so uh, you cannot be Krishna, you cannot be Buddha, you cannot be any of those guys. You are just going to be, you know, in, in this case, Joseph or Ocean or Shashi in my case, right? We're all going to be ourselves, a unique selves. So the priest doesn't know the answer and he is quite troubled. And uh, that night he can't sleep. So he, um, he dreams and in his dream, he goes to heaven. Oh, no. So he's on a train and uh, he doesn't know where the train is going. And he asks the uh, uh, the other people in the train, hey, where's this train going? And they says, oh, it's going to heaven. Oh, he's like, oh, OK, great. Yeah, thank God. And then uh, he's, uh, he's like, oh, you know, heaven is going to be blah, blah, blah. You know, it's going to be just amazing. I'm going to meet Socrates. I'm going to meet Jesus. I'm going to meet Krishna, Buddha, all these people. Right. Uh, and then um, he gets to heaven and uh, uh, it's just uh, pretty utterly boring and dull and there's nothing interesting about heaven and he's like just does not seem right this is something is not right maybe let me let me go to uh the hell all right and uh pull back yeah uh joseph uh so um he says okay um let me take the train to the hell and he goes to hell and he runs into socrates there uh, and Socrates is tilling the land. And uh, he says, uh, well, you know, Socrates, what's wrong? Like, why are you in heaven, hell here? I mean, aren't you supposed to be in heaven? So the response that Socrates gives is, you know, you, 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 Mr. Priest, you got something wrong again. Heaven and hell is not something where you go. You know, it is your inner thing, how you feel my presence here makes heaven around me. My inner being, be it in heaven or hell, I am in heaven. That is his perspective. But anyways, I, I don't know if that is connected with Ocean's story, uh, Ocean's uh, uh, point of view there. Uh, but Ocean, I think, do you, do you agree with me when I said, like, you got to separate it out? The action that you help, let it bring some bliss to you. Move on. You realize he's a child molester go and take a separate action on that without yeah I, I i i that's yeah that that, that that's how i live you know i um it's you know i i practice my own mental masturbation a lot i do things to make <laughs> myself happy I, I don't care about what other people or entire world thinks about me so yeah, yeah i agree yeah awesome awesome that that's a great <laughs> yeah. those those are one of those life's uh, yeah. I, uh questions i totally right? agree thank you thank you thank you uh, okay, so next we have uh, Joseph. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just really thank, quickly. Thank, um, you, thank you. Thank you for uh, referring. No, no problem, Ocean. No, yeah. I, no, I think that 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 one of the most important parts is you're talking about action, not being tied tied to outcomes, and that this is, um, uh, you know, kind of what Arjun is. Like he's a man of action, right? Uh, essentially, and it's not for selfish action. And this is where the relationship between uh, the action that you're taking is not tied to the outcome. 
Mm. Uh, and so that's the deep point within that um, uh, framework. So that is karma yoga. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you're letting go. And in that process, subsequent to that, what that does is it allows you to let go of then the ego. Mm. Um, so that if, uh, you know, it, um, and, and, you know, uh, so you start to understand what your ego actually is, mm -hmm. you know, what is it that, that is, is, you know, driving these things. Mm -hmm. Um, the other point that I think that was, um, uh, that it, well, it'll less, it, and that actually will just, let me briefly say that allows you get to get to, uh, what you talked about a couple of weeks ago with some very nice diagrams, uh, with the essence of the self mm. um within that within that process uh, but um this also uh comes back to um uh one other point that i was going to make um i forget it had to do with self self-discipline and so uh, self-control uh oh, so i don't yeah, self control essentially, uh, but uh, it'll have to come back to me. Um, I mean, uh, ultimately, your your understanding Atman, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, in this process, that's that's the goal. I mean, that's what you're kind of getting to. Uh, correct. And yeah. That's kind of, yeah, 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 and anyway. that Atman, Atman, and uh, you know the the consciousness, or uh, you know. Paramatma is another word that uh, throughout the book they use that term. Uh, Brahman, uh, they are kind of related, right? Uh, same same thing. Uh, the the um, if anything, you know, one could say that animals, um, because they don't have this uh, filter of the mind. Uh, not not that I, mean, I don't know if we know like maybe maybe there is maybe there's not right but they uh, we we can for all practical purposes let's say they don't have so called mind that we have um, so they are probably way closer to the atman right so we too are very close to atman it's just that yeah remember from the Drik Drisha Viveka the seer scene uh, lecture you know where there is the reflected consciousness that. Uh, once the consciousness comes, you know, consciousness is everywhere and there are certain different types of uh, beings, they have the property to take that consciousness and reflect. And that, that reflection process now assumes that it is the conscious body. So that is the ego part, right? So now it does not even look back saying, hey, look, I'm getting this consciousness from here, right? So I am it. And then, and then it goes about living in the world clueless and just saying it is me and that is you right that separation starts happening uh and that is the that is the miss uh, uh you know conditioning that we have been living uh, throughout our lives and you, we have to kind of uh, reevaluate our choices all along the way and uh you know the so you know gita kind of uh um brings that back uh in the whole vedanta everything right that that's the beauty of bhagavad gita is you know it's just like the shortest summary presented in a very palatable format uh yeah otherwise you know you could be reading uh hundreds of upanishad upanishads and uh, brahma sutra and stuff like that but uh you know this is a, this is a very compacted way of like how can you find that self and how can your action be selfless action right so there's no I ship. There's no I. Yeah, I, I know you use the word selfish, um, but uh, yeah, it, it's a matter of uh, understanding of uh, these two two different words. Yeah, uh, Jason, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I I find out actually I find out uh, Gandhi's uh, translation is pretty good. I don't know how do you think, but and I I find out that that's the one I can. Awesome. He read it, okay, because he he write something and he can from time to time he insert his own uh, comment, okay, and the comment read his comment and reread the verses, and I find that it's quite helpful, you know. I don't know how 
your opinion on that? Well, the Aurobindo stuff, right? The I I sent something. You know, if you look at the abstract of the meeting, there's a video there that I wanted. Did anybody watch that video at all that I sent? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we if we play the video. Uh, I would like to pause the video and you know we can have a nice discussion. This is a very small uh, one year of his lifespan, which is a life changing. A thing that happens to Aurobindo, and one of you know his uh, his detailed writings on Bhagavad Gita are also available. Uh, you can buy that on Amazon. I think it's like a book, um, uh, but he also has lots of essays and things like that. And one of the things that Bhagavad Gita does is that it. Um, that's why I think it has it has stood through the test of time, right? All through the ages, you know, God knows when it was written. But there has been perspectives, perspectives, depending on which time you look at what's going on in India or who is reading it. You know, there are some Western authors who have taken this and written their uh, expansion on it. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you look at what Shankara wrote about Bhagavad Gita, all these different ideas, right? Really, what you have to do is maybe pick two, three of them, and then you go back to the text. Like that's why the Aurobindo's text is kind of uh, important because you know we can't read Sanskrita. But if you read Aurobindo's text or even Gandhi's text, right, then don't get stuck with what they are saying, right? Think about in the terms of today's time, right? You know, we have AI problems. We have you know, issues in this country. We have so many things, you know, about me, my life, today's, what is, uh, make it a little more contemporary and uh, make it a little more relevant. Gandhi, what he does is, uh, he is writing the um, Gita um, more to basically stir up a notion of nationalism because they wanted to get rid of Britishers at that time, right? So a um, lot of his understanding of Gita is skewed, if you look at it, more towards calling for people to take action, help others, service others. But if you look at the larger context of what Krishna is talking about, it has nothing to do with a nation or even Hindu religion for that matter, right? It is really a deep, to me at least, right? It's a deep research work on how mind works and what is I. And it's a theory, uh, obviously, um, just like, you know, there's string theory to explain all the universes and galaxies and stuff like that. Nobody knows where the string is, right? Uh, so here there is a theory presented by some XYZ author and uh, it is, uh, and people can take that and use it for religious purposes they can use it for national politics uh, purposes. They can use it to guide students. Uh, you know, people can use it for old age. You know, how do you live life and how do you feel better about yourself? All kinds of uh, different things, right? Arbindo's beauty is that he was a freedom fighter literally at the same time as Gandhi. He also comes from uh, British education. His father was very anti-Indian. He moved the whole family to Britain and uh, he studied there uh, and he excelled one of their exams. I think it is called as ICS or something like that back then. And uh, Gandhi also became a barrister or a lawyer in Britain, right? And then he goes to Africa and then he comes to India. So that was his journey to come to India to help uh, the cause. Arbindo is participating in that. Gandhi takes this extreme step of saying non-violence. That is the only way we are going to do. If you look at Arbindo, some of his other essays, he, he does not say that that is, you know, he was not opposed to violence. Violence that is coming from, it's almost kind of like what Krishna is telling to Arjuna, right? There is, there is a purpose for everything, you know, um, and uh, the the understanding of violence and nonviolence can go beyond hurting somebody, just like, you know, physically hurting is what Gandhi was uh, focused on, right? You know, blood 
pouring out of somebody else's body. Um, that was that is a way of looking at violence. But there's also a very subtle kind of a violence that happens in the society, just because how we come across to them, how we talk to them. You know, they they might feel hurt. That hurt multiplies in the society. They go and hurt more other people, right? That is a perpetuating violence that we are creating in the society because of our ignorance. And Arbindo's focus was not, he was thinking a little bit farther. He was saying, of course, we want to get India to be independent. But how can we create citizens who are going to be, he calls it as an integral yoga, right? It's very interesting. He talks about how can we change human beings from inside so that we are way more, th this notion of oneness spreads and India becomes this example for rest of the world. And, you know, we multiply this across the world. You know, everybody is living their fullest. That was his whole uh, thing. And he was not limited to the cause that Gandhi's cause was. Gandhi's cause was very much about independence uh, from, against Britishers. Uh, but they very relevant. Gandhi is also a Mahatma. He's almost, to me, he's very revered, almost at the level of Buddha. Uh, but there is a subtle slant to his reading. That's why I presented both of them, right? And, that you can get a lot of other uh, things. Uh, there, there is no reason why you would go and dig up Arbindo's or Gandhi's translation, but these are, I think, two sort of uh, diametrically different type of interpretations of Gita, and uh, it is good for you guys to make your own judgment. So, obviously, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. Anyway, th thank you for this kind of uh, uh, information because I, I just from the outside point of view, I find out that's easy to understand. Easy but, to understand. but I I will pay attention on the his. But at least uh, at this uh, so far, I haven't smelled the uh, Gandhi's nationalism theory in this one. At least. I, oh. Okay. I, I haven't. Yeah. Yet. Okay. Yeah. So, but but I think I but that's my personal belief. You know? No, no, I wouldn't, say, to... I, I wouldn't say nationalism. I think it's more about like you know he takes this whole uh, idea of uh, okay. So Gandhi's purpose was it was a little more like there were too many poor people, right? So what he was trying to do there were there were poor people. There was also low caste tribes. You know there was caste system what that was rampant. So he wanted to fight Britishers, but but then he was also trying to bring these poor people uh, to uh, you know so that they can feel comfortable with the rest of the Hindu Brahmins and everybody. And then they can serve the final purpose, which is getting Britishers out of the country. So how can you rally the poor people? And even we even have Muslims right there. So his whole thing was Hindu Muslim, their brother brothers, right? And uh, he, he was also like trying to tell the middle class and upper class people, hey, look, Gita says you need to help other mankind. So there's that message that is very prevalent in his uh, reading of Gita is like, help other people, help them so that they will love you back and they will help the larger cause. Um, so that, that's how I interpreted it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And anyway, thank you. But, but my personal idea is if the writer a little bit biased, they will make it easier to understand. But <laughs> I have to aware, you know, the, yeah. the translator's bias, you know, so that, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that probably that's the reason I find out easy to read, but Absolutely. it's great from time to time if you remind me, okay, yeah. uh, that's Gandhi's uh, interpretation, that would be very helpful, you know, anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, great. Yeah, great. I think the ja Javani has a hands up before. Yeah. I know she had, but also Ahad has been wanting to probably say something. Ahad, do you want to say something? You want to join the conversation? I would love to uh, hear the funnier version of the story <laughs> if you want to present. Um, uh, okay, so a little ago, uh, did somebody want to speak? Ahad, do you want to speak or probably not? Mo uh, Mona. Oh, Mona, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, um, um, I was wondering how to um 
bring this up in the conversation. I really appreciated your your story and everything you've shared. Um, I'm new to the to the meeting meetup, so I'm I'm just gonna Welcome. come out Welcome. with. Yeah. Um, I was trying to understand what you were saying in the context of Buddhism, when when the whole purpose is to realize the Buddha nature, right? That's in in the self, but also in everyone else. Yeah. So the 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 point that I got out of it is that once you realize it, you still have to go back in the village and live the life, mm -hmm. and um, and then um, and then you cannot. Um, just pretend life is not happening you still have to be part of life and do what's needed to be yeah. done but it's not you it's like the best archery has no archer right like but it still has to happen <laughs> yeah uh, so that's that that was my understanding and then that kind of clears the the field because everyone has the same potential so if 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 there is the knowing inside me or inside you, there is the knowing inside everyone. And who's to say how things should turn out, right? Why should my will prevail, prevail over anyone else's? Yeah, and that's where you want to, when the sentence has my will, that's the problem, right? Right, right. right. So you, you don't want to, if it is a my will, uh, you want to understand has that has that will um, does it have a driver like am I judging people is it going to hurt somebody and is it coming do I feel like this other person so one of one of the things I think Jyoti I don't know if you're still there uh, so one of the things that uh, Jyoti was asking was this meditation right practice so in uh, in one of the earlier things and it might be relevant to what Mona is asking as well is when a, when a person or an object, you know, comes across you, right? Our immediate response is we are trying to put a name or an identity, a sex, girl, boy, woman, man, uh, black, white, whatnot, right? So these superficial things, we immediately want to first identify, right? So, um, there are these uh, characteristics that are there. So those characteristics, as our mind is thinking about that, mind is also, if you know the person or if you know that color of that skin, you are going to relate, look back in your memory and history, and you're gonna pick up some stories to kind of bring it to your table in your mind before you even interact with this person, right? That is the part that one of the meditation practices says is when you are facing the world, uh, there are these, uh, I'm forgetting what the name was used for this, but uh, I'll, it'll come back to me. I'll have to go look at the material. But there are these names and forms and things like that. Immediately, don't even tell your mind, shut that down. Don't, don't worry about what that person's name is. What that, Of course, you want to acknowledge the person. That's not the point. But if that is bringing you back the old memories, wipe it away, right? And you want to, that Buddha nature that you talked about, right? I, I have a Buddha nature. The other person also has a Buddha nature. Now, the other person might have a very uh, so-called evil reputation, reputation out in the world, that's okay. Your Buddha nature is going to be Buddha. You're going to observe the Buddha in the other person, right? What that means is that evil nature is not your business. That is something that if you want to deal with it, that's a separate problem. But here you are facing that. Don't bring the name for him. Don't bring the past history, nothing. And he's coming for, she's coming for some reason. So always look at the something i mean positive is a bad term but understand that this other person just like i have existence awareness and my bliss appreciate that other person also has existence awareness and bliss that is the connecting element right and and then you let the conversation happen 
and the, the, the you know, so um, seeing God is not like, you know, you, it's not some uh, magical thing, you know, where God with two different horns is going to come in front of you. No, that's not the point. It's um, manifesting divinity, manifesting that Buddha. When you say, I have reached my Buddha nature, let it manifest. What that also means is let that manifest from the other thing. What that means is you have to be willing to let that happen. And when that happens, right? So that, that immediately opens this pathway uh, to, um, you also, you know, it opens the pathway for you to feel the oneness. You might enjoy the conversation. Uh, you know, things are going to happen probably in the right way. If you want to express something that is something not very uh, pleasant, that very pleasant and very, uh, you know, disturbing, all of that is a name form type of a thing. But you want a direct communication pathway. But if you create an environment where this kind of communication is possible, the other person might receive it well or might not receive it well. So, Go with that attitude, not with a winning, you know, like I'm going to win or lose, right? Which is what Arjuna's problem was. Arjuna was worried he might win, right? And that also was a little bit of an arrogance because Krishna says to him, why do you think you're going to win? You know, you think you're such a big warrior? No, you might even lose. What about that? You know, so I, I think you're getting the point, right? I think, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so when I you think are, it opens the door to to allow for what happens. What like, happens exactly? What, what happens happens, yes. right? Yes. And now you're now you're acting from the consciousness perspective, not your mind, not your senses, none of that, right? Not your right. intellect, where you have memory of past and stuff like that. Shove that aside. Be present. When they say here and now, right? You know, we just don't know, right? You know, we all these terminologies have been thrown around so much. We all know the right terminologies. It's just <laughs> how to act upon it. And I think that's that's a meditation te technique, Jyoti, right? Um, so you were asking about a meditation technique, right? Meditation is obviously, uh, there is a meditation where you can sit and do something. One of the meditation practices in chapter six, which uh, Jason reminded me, uh, is, you know, so you, um, you're sitting and... Um, uh, obviously, you know, there's a, there's a whole thing where he says, you know, find a comfortable place and you know, what you sit on, you know, uh, they, they say, you know, you want to sit on a deer skin and all that stuff, you know, again, you know, we want to bring it to reality of what our life is. Um, and, uh, you know, fi find a comfortable place, you know, you sit down and stuff like that. And the, you know, look at the nose tip, right? The nose tip and you close your eyes uh, if you've ever seen Buddha's pictures, right, they always show his eyes half open, if you notice that. That half open nature, right, of the eyes, it's almost, and how do you get to that half open is, obviously, you don't want to close your eyes. When you close your eyes, the problem is that you might fall asleep. <laughs> That's asleep. Sleep is not meditation. Uh, it's good, but it's not meditation. Um, sleep is only good because you're not destroying, you're not creating more destruction to your mind out in the world. <laughs> uh, so you bring the eyes where the eyes are now looking at the nose tip. What that does apparently is that almost everything starts looking kind of blurred up. And one of the most important teaching in Vedanta is we have to come to a point where we can see this world as a dream. Yes, it is real. You know, when I somebody hits my hand, it hurts, all of that stuff. But so does it hurt us when we are in our dream state, right? When we are dreaming, uh, it will hurt us in the dream. And it, it seems very real there, right? And it is feeling very real here too. So um, one, of the, one of the devices, if you will, right, in Vedanta is that to consider this as to some extent a dream, what that means is all the good things and the bad things that have happened to you, just like how they happen to you in the night, in the dream, in the morning you wake up and it's as if nothing has happened. And in fact, nothing has happened, right? 
So you want to take the events that are happening around you lightly. Why? So that it doesn't impact your mind. Again, your mind, you know, think about the calmness, a serene lake. There shouldn't be any ripples. Your mind should be like that, right? So the, so the meditation practice is you close your thing and tip of the nose. And now you, I'm going to also uh, talk about what Kevin asked very first question about ohm. Um, so now when you are looking at the tip of the nose, um, let your mind wander. The goal of it is you follow that thought. You are observing that thought, how it is leading to multiple thoughts. And, uh, you know, you might start thinking about your daughter-in-law or brother or something and blah, 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 right? And you will notice that train of thought will usually lead to something very utterly negative. <laughs> and, and again, then you immediately pull yourself back and realize, look, this train of thought has brought me to this place where it is utterly negative. None of that is real. And all of that, your mind has painted these thoughts in you, right? So uh, the idea um, is that you observe, so you are observing you thinking, right? So now there is a distance that you have created between your mind, which you think is you, but now you're saying, oh, look, I can see these thoughts and look, I hate this person. So these thoughts are coming about that person, or I'm worried about my son and he's going to, he drives this car very erratically and he's going to commit an accident and he's going to die, right? So that's the fear. Uh, so, and then none of that has happened, but the mind has built this story for you. And then that kind of, you know, in real life, when that happens, what you tend to do is you're sitting with your son and giving him a whole bunch of advice or doing something, again, totally figment of your imagination, and you are reacting to that, to that situation. So the meditation practice is that when the train of thought is now coming, fine, stay with the train of thought, but then you immediately, once you realize it's like, oh, I'm not following with the thought, but I'm observing the thought, and you just say, Om. Om is sort of like, boom, it comes and breaks that thought process. Om, again, Kevin, if you're still there. Are you still there, Kevin? Oh, Kevin. Yeah, he's there. Okay. So Om is nothing but a disruptor in our thought process. It really has a connotation like, you know, it is one of the root words for every word, you know, everything. It's, it's a representation of consciousness. Consciousness, we came out of consciousness. It's as if, you know, let's say I'm dreaming, right? In my dream, I see Jason and I see some other people and friends and stuff like that, right? But Jason is real out there. But in my dream, the Jason is my imagination, right? So, and I am putting the qualities to Jason, X, Y, Z, he's doing something. So I'm imagining the whole story in my dream. So one of the things Vedanta says is, there's Brahman, and this is dream of Brahman that we are in. So we are all the roles of Brahman imagining, right? Again, it's a theory. So um, the Om is a u ma so if you look at how it comes, a, u, ma, so it, it covers the whole space of our mouth. And all the syllables, all the vowels, all the words sort of emerge out of this a, u, ma, om. Uh, so it is almost kind of like the root, if you will, right? But really what it is, it's a disruptor word. And, you know, in, in Christianity or Muslim religion, you have amen. Same thing, I think, right? You are basically, you can use that as a device in your meditation practice when that thought process is continuing, om, and then suddenly your mind is like, oh, I don't need to be thinking that thought. And, you know, I'm back to normal. Uh, again, staring at my nose tip. And now some other fluttering thought comes about. And then again, you let it drag along. 
say om and the people typically say chanting uh, you know the more the chance that they have the more the closer they are to the God, right? And that's the typical Hindu beliefs, right? I, I say one million uh, Ramas and, you know, Krishna and stuff, and like suddenly that is supposed to be good. Well, no, um, the idea in the meditation or the purpose of Japa or taking the name of God or Om is really for you to basically look at how far along do you space out the ohm? If the ohm is spaced out really far out, either you are running with the mind thoughts or you have created a nice gap between the two thoughts. And you have been able to interrupt and you are not following with the thought. So that is a measure of how peaceful you have gotten in that one hour or whatever amount of 20 minute meditation that you do, right? And see what it does to your mind, right? Because obviously when we are in real life, um, you know, we are dragged down, our mind is dragged down into lots of uh, uh, futile things, right? Um, so that is one meditation practice. And the other is, it's a constant meditation, right? You know, let's say you're cooking or you're talking with somebody, you're doing whatever, you know, same thing that I was telling to Mona, right? Observe yourself in the action. That is also meditation, right? So here I am, I'm facing somebody who I absolutely love, might be my son. That love might make me react in a certain way. I need to watch my reaction. Or I, I'm here with a person that I don't particularly like. How can I come at it from a deeper level, not just from my mind? How can I shut down my mind? And mentally, you can chant the Om. That's okay. And, you know... So that, again, don't let the names and forms kind of bias your decision-making process. That's also a, almost like you're living in meditation, basically, right? At that point, uh, interacting with people in a certain way and observing yourself. Many a times, you know, I've, I've noticed this in myself is like, I'll have a conversation with a friend and after a certain time, I realize, oh boy, you know, I shouldn't have said that. So that is an observation based on the philosophical understanding of all this literature, like, oh, you know, maybe I should have gone uh, differently about that. Now, what can I do about it? You know, I can apologize and all that stuff, but really, I mean, that apology can be futile. But my goal is that gap that exists between the action and where I feel the remorse comes closer. While I am in the action, I realize, oh, this is gonna cause me remorse. So let me watch it, right? I don't want to create this wrong thing, not because I'm going to get some benefit from that other person. No, it is about my own mind. It is impacting my mind, right? So anyways, I, I think I covered Mona's question, Jyoti's question, I think to some extent Kevin's question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jyoti, go ahead. Your turn. Uh, you're muted, I think. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. So my question was essentially what Mona was saying when you had learned, Buddha has learned all these things, but then he goes back to the village. So when I was working, I'm retired now, so the situation is different. My Eastern mind was with the Western mind. My Eastern mind was, let it go. It's not a win-win situation. If you lose, that's okay. So the Western mind was saying, oh, it's good. Jody has a laid back approach. But let's take, let's give Jody the, you know, the worst of worst because she doesn't seem to care. It was not that I didn't, I didn't care. I cared very much. I wanted to be equally divided up. But those people, everything, it was like a question of life and death with them. For mm -hmm. me, it was like, hey, listen, I got some extra work to do. What the heck? I'll do it. Mm -hmm. But then it became like a second nature with them mm -hmm. that Jody doesn't seem to mind it. Hey, Jody, do this too. Do this too. So, you know, you get a little tired of sometimes the Gita preachings, which I am. I'm, you know, it's so much easier for me to do now 
you know, while I'm retired because I don't have any conflict anymore. So how do you resolve something like that, mm. that you are great in your own throne, but when you go out, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like people are taking advantage of you. Absolutely. Saying, yeah. yeah, no, I, I think I get your point there. I okay. think I think one of the approaches is when you sign up to do an action, are you doing it? Uh, are you doing that action as a way to avoid a conflict with that person, or are you doing that action because that is your true calling? Like the work that you got assigned by the person you said with Judy, right? Um, uh, you, you took the name Judy, isn't it? No, I did not. I said the well, and actually, it turns out her name was Judy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what it was is that I was a school psychologist, and right. we are giving given certain amount of work to do, and they invariably they'll pick up the lighter load. Oh yeah, and the high um, the heavier load would come to me. Well, to me, it was not. It was okay. It's a hard work. It was a little harder worker work than them. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, I yeah. chose to do it. I said that's okay. You know, it was. There were both reasons. There, there were two reasons. One was avoid the conflict, and second was it, it really didn't mean that much to me. Mm -hmm. It was okay. It might be a little extra time for me to put in. Yeah, but then they kept uh, taking advantage of you. They kept taking advantage. Advantage. And of you. a point did come at the end. When I just had to put my foot down and I say, you know what, I have a limit too. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I think that that is, again, the Gita preaching does not preach you any sort of advice about ethical uh, good or bad. So let me be very clear about it, right? So here Krishna is asking Arjuna to go chop off his brothers. You know, he's very brutal about it. And he says, that is your action, call to action at this moment. So if you uh, were happy when the task were, tasks were assigned to you and you that was your inner calling and you did it, and at some point you realized, hey, you know what? This is it. You put your foot down and you say, Judy, I'm not doing this, right? I'm done and that is it. But don't uh, let, in everything you do, I think what I've learned is that if it is leaving any kind of impression on your mind, then you have to like, oh, I have swayed away from the path. If that, if that action leaves you an impact on your mind, then you might want to think about maybe there should be a different approach. But if you honestly think that Judy is taking a wrong advantage of you, and if you said it, and as hard as it might sound to Judy, but from your point of view, it was not coming from any kind of hatred or anything. You were just overloaded and something was not right about the situation. You're bringing up to it. And, you know, be, be kind when you're telling to Judy that, hey, look, this is just not right. And I, I, I'm fine with you sending one or two cases every so often, but it feels like this is happening way too often. I'm here to help. And uh, and and which you did the right thing. So it, that was your calling at that moment. Uh, yeah, but the fact but that you I carried guess... it this long is something that I think you, you might want to forgive yourself and that's okay. That's what I was going to say. I let it yeah. simmer for so long yes. until this person became habitual. <laughs> and she didn't understand that. That was a sad part. That's what I say that Eastern mind versus Western mind she really did not understand that this is the goodness of my heart. Ah, it's not okay. that you could just go on and on with it. Or don't Once ever, twice. I was telling Ocean, right, earlier on, yeah. don't ever do anything out of the goodness of your heart. That is ego talking. Okay, just think about it, right? You know, so if you are doing something where, okay, Judy assigned the task to you, you accept it because maybe you have a downtime. And if, you're, if you are really super busy, you say, honestly, you say no. You don't do it because you want to impress upon Judy, right? No, 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 no. I think that's where we are wrong. I was not trying to impress her. I was yeah. trying to make her feel that, hey, this is not as bad as you think it is. It can be done, mm -hmm. but don't make such a big deal about it. I'll do it. 
but then that she misunderstood my intentions right right yeah right. no i think i think you get the point you get the point right yeah yeah, yeah. thank and you I think, thank you i think you. in general when it comes to like you know uh, whenever you are getting to a sentence where say you are saying i am helping you that's ego talking because when you're helping you realize you want to realize is it bringing happiness to me stay with the joy part of it don't bring i in that conversation now if you don't want that joy that's okay you just completely come to judy say look i i can't do this anymore that's it <laughs> and don't Thank don't you. let don't let even the good dwell with you or the bad dwell with you in your mind okay. both are bad <laughs> <laughs> thank you that that's good yes thank you hey joseph do you want to give elad uh ehad a chance yes yeah. i do i do yeah. ehad go ahead oh okay so uh thank you shashi for the story i i really did uh, uh find out the story and it was very very fun i mean uh the uh, the i guess the priest is moving on a train and it's like going to be this so uh well a very short chain was there because uh the priest takes goes uh directly to the, to the train to a person that is just like sitting on a pedestal and it's in, uh, it's a the devil itself like he meets this is the priest just meet the uh the socrates the character is just really meeting a devil Ah. so that's how it that's how it went for, for us so yeah that was a part of the story and uh, as far as the meditation is concerned i guess it's more and more of uh, it's a it's a good good way to have a uh, part of the reasoning and meditation that's that's very yeah that's about it. absolutely yeah if you if you run across that joke you know you might want to paste that on our meetup page in the comment section uh or if you have it ready you can just put it here but that it could be a funny you know all these funny yeah, stories you know, they're quite that, enlightening that's so part of the meaning because we connect uh it's not like uh good and evil together it's like evil this thing is on one side uh -huh. and then it becomes good and evil in the circle so good for for uh for as far as what that is concerned but uh for us it's more like uh when uh something is stumped upon we just consider it just just like evil and then then what you want to do is that we want to just condition all the way down so it becomes like you are just like uh doing just good 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 and then it's right <laughs> then it, it gets to the right point mm. so that's how it goes with so i think the evil thing that that's really the true meaning with yeah with good and evil as per as far as i could interpret the the text that i read i see i see okay cool uh was there anything else i think there's another comment you have there moment of truth everyone chooses the simple questions to do because questions uh i don't i don't know i mean do you want to say something about that or you're done that was that was the, the same comment to the story the story that you told me that was <laughs> ah that was okay good. i see i see okay all right and uh, dlj asks a question uh what is consciousness in this context uh dlj is you're that you're there you want to join here i'm here yeah hey hey dlj um uh so sorry what what's your name again should i just call you d or i think you were you were here earlier too yeah yeah i've been around yeah dlj is fine that's what they call DLJ. me okay okay uh, yeah 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 i think at one point <laughs> did you have me with the hosting process or something uh yeah uh, okay so did he charge you <laughs> oh. uh, that, that would be doing something purely for myself i wouldn't do that <laughs> so like yeah so you're using words like mind intellect and consciousness and as separate things yes so I'm, I'm hoping for some definitions if you can <laughs> okay absolutely absolutely very good question yeah very good question in fact i think further down i think maybe it's the seventh or eighth chapter i forget which one there is a little more details around this uh, topic but uh, yeah um so consciousness is something that 
uh, you know, um, is almost kind of, uh, think of it as like uh, electricity, right? For example, electricity, you turn on the switch, it flows through the wire and the bulb glows. The bulb is the mind, our intellect, our senses in our body. So consciousness is that life force, if you will, or the whole notion of consciousness uh, is what uh, helps us be that I, the notion of I, I am, I think, I am doing this, I am talking, I listen to what DLJ is saying, DLJ is listening to what I'm saying, right? So I that that whole thing we are in this ocean of consciousness, if you will, right? The consciousness is, get, is getting kind of a different type of personalities through our mind and senses. So our eyes become eyes because of that notion of consciousness sitting behind there. And our eyes can actually, the pictures that are coming in are making sense. You know, I can see DLJ there. I can see uh, J, uh, other people, Jason and everybody, right? Um, so I can distinguish and stuff like that. Uh, otherwise, pictures are just dead by themselves, right? But there is a consciousness gives us that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, thing uh, to interpret all of this stuff. Mind is... Mind and intellect, if you will, um, is um, uh, one, one of the ways uh, to interpret mind is mind is the closest thing that exists to our senses. So what I'm seeing through my eye, the very first filter is the mind. So mind has some notions about DLJ or Jason or other people or this laptop. So those notions are either good or bad, right? Mind wants to immediately categorize them. Oh, this is a good experience or this is a bad experience, right? So that now intellect is basically, intellect is almost kind of a collection of, if you will, uh, past memory, you know, all the learnings that you have had so far, uh, that is a collection of that. And intellect, intelligence, if you will, intelligence is a bit more larger scope of things where you have the ability to learn. Intellect is a collection of knowledge so far in your lifespan. And that could be your memories also, right? About a person, about an action, about certain connotations, social conditioning, everything will fall in that bucket. So now, the uh, so as you can see, right? Uh, our eye looks at an object, mind puts that filter on. Now, intellect is going to put yet another filter based on the past history, and that past history is going to be either abused or you do something good with it, right? Again, you come from a very selfish perspective, and you you say, hey, like you know, I'm I'm trying to protect my I-ness. My I-ness could be my body, my lifespan, or it could be also um, uh, my family, my friends, whatever helps me define me, right? And um, so in Kathopanishad, you know, one of the things that we did a while ago, uh, we covered this uh, thing where uh, it's, it's almost kind of like a chariot. And um, so the horses are the uh, the senses, eye, um, mouth, skin, touch, all of that stuff, right? So those are the horses. Imagine that, right? It's a cart. The reins are the mind. The guy who is controlling the reins is the intellect. And the owner of this whole thing, if you will, is the consciousness, right? Um, so he's the he is the he's the king or, you know, whoever he's traveling in that cart. Now, if you let your horse decide what needs to happen with that cart, like if your sense says, oh, I, I see some uh, pretty person there and all that, right? And I'm going to just like keep following that person, right? So now what has happened is the horse has taken over the cart and the whole cart is moving behind there. Now, 
what Vedanta says is that, you know, you want to let the owner of the cart guide the decision-making process. So the, the, your action with the cart, if everything is balanced, it is going to go by the, what consciousness wants to do. Or another way, if you believe in God, it's what God wants to do on this planet, right? Um, but if you, if you don't want to believe in God, that's okay. It's about a larger purpose than these filters, this mind filter, the brain filter, the intellect filter, all of that, right? Um, the, those filters, how can we um, have them cause less effect on this cart that is getting driven? Um, otherwise, you know, the cart to this extent, it is just get going into uh, all kinds of directions because these horses are pulling it in random ways, right? I, I think you understand that, right? Now, a little bit? Uh, yeah, that was very useful. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was writing things, I was mapping it onto the way I see it. So I think <clears throat> without going into detail, I, I'm using the terminology in probably completely different way around, but you've got all the component parts that I wanted to see there. So uh, yeah. yeah, there's also- my Consciousness is the, the thing that creates the eye. I agree with that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So you might also want to read uh, Plato's, uh, there's this, uh, there's, uh, there's the fable about uh, the cave, I think, right? Uh, yeah. that's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, anyways, so we have only a couple minutes left. Uh, Jason, do you want to say something? Oh, sorry. Uh, we have uh, Joseph. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Hey, your audio, your audio is messed up. Joseph, your audio is messed up. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, your audio has some problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds like a Dalek. It's been invaded by the Daleks. <laughs> that, that's an ohm, you know, so. <laughs> anyway, Joseph, Joseph, you can, you can come back again. Jason, do you want to say something? Yeah, uh, it's toward to the end. Thank you so much. And then I, 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 I do want to uh, mention about the interesting part I realized because next week I'm going to talk about the Taoism. I'm preparing for next week to talk about Taoism. Yes. Uh, Zhuangzi's Taoism. And uh, that chapter, I'm reading that one and they have the sentence talking about kind of meditation or sit straight and uh, uh, sit straight and uh, uh, doing some Chinese medicine stuff. And a lot of the translator interpret, kind of interpret as philosophy meaning like going to the middle way, don't go too much. But when I read the chapter six, especially on the verses 11, 12, 13, and 14, right? It basically, it, I believe uh, Krishna is talking about physical, you have to sit on the spot and uh, like a kusha grass, deer yes. skin, and you have a sister in your trunk, your head, your neck, and your eye on your nose, breathe, control your mind. I think he talked about physical thing, right? So. I, I, a, there is a way to interpret that. You know, you have to understand the context of when this was presented. Um, you know, way back when they didn't have cushions and sofas and trains and planes, right? So the whole idea is that you don't want to be sitting on a cold rock because the meditation mm -hmm. is to for you to rise above your physical needs. Yeah, my 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 point is, I find out the interest for the. Uh, Asian, uh, especially Indian and the Chinese uh, writing, because when they talk about this thing, they even care about physically how to do it, right? So we don't see Plato writing something, say you see straight and then you look at somewhere, you know, they all talk about- Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ritual- It's uh, interesting to, to insert this yeah. kind of physical activity, you know, but we don't have to take uh, literally, like I have to sit yeah, with no. the deer skin to sit uh, by the cushy grass. No, we don't have to do that. But basically, they care about it's how done. your body do it. So yeah. I find out because I, I prepare for the next week and I find out this one. I find, yeah, that's interesting, you know, because they 
both care about how you physically do, you know, when you do something. Yeah, and, and that's a problem, right? I mean, even in Bible, when uh, Jesus says, the path is through me. The path is through me is taken very literally. And same thing Krishna says, you know, dedicate your actions to me and uh, you're going to be fine. Right. So that is, again, taken by a lot of Hindus, literally. And that is cause of so much trouble on this planet. Right. That, hey, if you look, the Bible says this, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell. Right. Um, and same thing, a Hindu can say that to Muslim people. Right. And th this literalism is a problem. Uh, but uh, but once you peel the layers off what Krishna is saying, what Jesus is saying, what Buddha is saying, what Muhammad is saying, they're very, very deep you know uh, important things anyways so yeah yeah thanks everyone i guess thanks jyoti um and you want to take a a, a a few minutes to talk about uh july 10th uh, yeah so july 10th eight, eight right what we can do is june 10th you mean right yeah june 10th june, june 10th june yeah. 10. so what we can do is if you feel like your voice has been heard then we can continue, but I'm open for one more of this kind of an open round discussion. Uh, if you feel like you want to talk a little more before we move to the next section, uh, what do you guys think? Joseph, do you want to say something? What, what do you think about this idea of having another discussion or do you, do you feel like people have had their chance and then now we move on to the next chapters? Um. I like this discussion. I mean, I still have some things that I can, you know, we you can talk more? about. Um, you want one more? We could do one more. Yeah, we, we could do, do one, one more. more. We could do one more. Absolutely. Yeah. So we so could. You want, to, you want to make it as a discussion section on June tenth, yeah. and, and we can we can this time just maybe focus on four, five, six, and uh, you know we sort of I think did one to three, and obviously you can bring up one to three, but uh, I would also encourage uh, in that. Uh, please look at that video of our bindo. His okay. that that video kind of walks you through this whole idea of how a the worldly problems you can take it personally and how it can impact you and how he, how you can change a bad situation into something that is a little more uh, you know. So it, how how long is the video? Oh, it's like thirty, 30 minutes. minutes. Thirty okay, minutes. Okay, so how about like this? I'm going to post on the meetup. So it's already in the invite. It's already yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, because I post on the multiple uh, uh, yeah. meetup group, so yeah. I'm going to put on the uh, headline. So re seems like nobody read it, uh, watch it this time. Because we did, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to make it as a requirement, kind of requirement, the ticket to watch it and then we can focus on that and that's a shift the focus on uh, chapter four, five and the six and for the next time. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And bring your own question. I, I, I will rephrase the, uh, I will add the chat GPT to write a, another question. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for, for the next uh, uh, two weeks from now. So, you know, so cool. yeah, anyway, uh, thank you everyone and thank you sashi and then uh, june 10th in two weeks so let's continue to discuss and then uh, next week uh, let's uh, refresh and you know, go back to the other side of the world and the reason oh, yeah, that's you, right. you may some you. you may find something just totally opposite but sometimes something identical that's up to you how are you going to interpret so uh, i think uh, it's bra good brain exercise by jumping from Indian, Chinese, Western, and then uh, kind of like, you know, good exercise on your brain. We, we may not have the con uh, identical conclusion, but, you know, uh, it's a good exercise, I think. Yeah, cool. yeah I'll, I'll probably try to join as well your session, Jason. Sorry, I've just been- No problem, you know, and everybody have a busy busy life and then, you know, so you are, and then uh, we, we will be happy, you know, to see everyone you know, when you have a moment, join us and then open your mic. So, <laughs> thank you so much. See you Thanks. next week. Bye -bye. And then, bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.